Hello to all of our Pleasant Green congregation and to all of our listeners and people of God. This is Minister Leonard Harris, and again, it is a blessing and opportunity to come before you to share the Word of God. And this is Lesson 11 out of Unit 3 uh, for November the 15th, 2020. And our unit title is Godly Love Among Believers. And our lesson's title is Loving Others. Our devotional reading is from the book of Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verses 1 through 8. And our background scriptures are from the book of 1 John, the 3rd chapter, verses 11 through 24, 2 John, 4 through 11, and then 3 John, verses 5 through 8. And our printed passage is 1 John, the 3rd chapter, verses 11 through 24. Our key verse is, The one who keeps God's commandments lives in him, and he in them. And this is how we know that God lives in us. We know it by the Spirit He gives us. Our lesson's aims are to explore the many dimensions of loving others according to 1 John and 3, to embrace God's commandments to love with obedience and expectation, to identify ways to grow in your faith in Jesus and your love for others. And our lesson has three parts. And the first part is the evidence test. And our second part is love demonstrated and our conclusion is love produces confidence so again it is always uh, a blessing uh, for us to indulge in the teachings of scripture and before we do that we on the knees of our heart, we ask God Almighty to be the utterance that you would have us to receive at this time. And then when we hear your word, compel and convict us by your spirit that we will live out the things that we hear and that we would not just be hearers, but also doers of your word. And we ask it in the name of Christ and for his sake. Amen. Now, this lesson starts out uh, with a nice uh, introduction. It relates a practice that we find in our social being, in the social culture. Uh, it speaks of a practice uh, among many in the uh, electronic domain, uh, on the internet, and in the social media. Um, it's equated to or compared with a practice in marketing and uh, referred to as branding. And uh, prior to uh, this practice, many of us uh, in our apparel, uh, we would be somewhat inclined or influenced 
uh, to purchase certain apparel items uh, based upon the brand name of the product. And not always uh, cognizant of what drew us to that particular model or that particular uh, product. Uh, but through the marketing and advertising of it and the continuance of seeing it, we were somewhat drawn to if I'm going to purchase a pair of slacks or shoes or a jacket or whatever the clothing item was, that because we had seen this same image portrayed day after day, month after month, year after year, we were more inclined to look for that particular item than per se other items. And we became the marketing for that brand because the more it was purchased and circulated in the society, the more that name and that brand was seen, which inclined others to want to also purchase the same product. And so our lesson uh, talks about branding and uh, it breaks it down into categories. Uh, it starts off with consistency and then differentiation and then creativity and the emotional connection and it's interesting how these four different categories have different functions and purposes uh, relative to what our lesson is unfolding to us today the consistency of it is, is that the brand must have the same message and effect on every customer. And then the differentiation is, is that the brand creates a gap between itself and competitors in the mind of the consumer. And the creativity of it is, is that the brand is the product of innovative ideas that produce unique messages. And the emotional connection is the brand creates a gap between itself and the competitors in the mind of the consumer. And... In our lesson today, these same expectations that are developed by those who are branding a service or a product or even a idea to the consumer is the same inference that Christ displayed and placed emphasis on at the Last Supper when he was speaking to his disciples and then at the end he made this commandment to them which is the center of the focus of our lesson that they would be identified and determined by the love that was shown to them and then in turn they showed it and practiced it and demonstrated it and displayed it to others and it would be by the expression of how they demonstrated this love that would set them apart from others in the world and at the beginning of our lesson in First uh, John, uh, the third chapter, and I believe it starts at the uh, beginning verse, and it says, 
Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the children of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know him. And so the brand that God has placed upon us is is that we are the offspring of God. We are the manifestation of the Spirit of God. And our key verse verifies this because it says that the world will know it, will know that we are emanating the Spirit of God from within because it says this is what He gave us. That God gave us the spiritual presence of God manifested in us. And so, as we look at our lesson, and our beginning starts off, uh, and it says, For this is the message that ye heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And when we say that we heard from the beginning, this is, again, in the 13th chapter of John and the 35th verse. It is the beginning of God, of Christ departure from his disciples and this is the great command that he placed upon his disciples so it is spoken of as the beginning because this was considered to be not the end of Christ's work but the beginning of the furtherance of the work of Christ and that comes through discipleship that means that the disciples of Christ first of all must be disciplined our lesson said to speak about uh, loving and with obedience and expectation and many times for us to be obedient we must first be disciplined and disciplined by the Word of God and so our lesson goes on to make a distinction in the first part, and it says the evidence test. And here it tells us that when we say we love one another, it shouldn't be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And then it says, and why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers was righteous so it says do not be surprised my brothers and sisters if the world hates you for you know that if you have passed from death to life because we love each other anyone who does not remain uh, anyone who does not love remains in death and anyone who hates a brother or a sister is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him now when we look at Cain we know the story from the book of Genesis and we realize that a offering was given back to God for all of the many blessings that God had given to Abel and Cain. And Abel looked upon what God had blessed Abel with and sought to give God the best of what he had to offer unto God for God given unto Abel the best. Cain, on the other hand, presented a gift that was not equal or was not of the best that Cain had to give. And when the two gifts were received, one was welcomed 
and the other was shunned. And because of this, Cain could not accept the fact that it was in his own mindset that he offered something that was not necessarily, it was not equal in comparison to what Abel offered. But what it was is that it was not the best that Cain could have offered. And so many times uh, we want to give back to the Creator something less than what the Creator has given to us. We want to uh, be blessed and favored to the utmost, but when it comes time for us to return and give back unto the Creator what was given to us, now we want to be a little short. Now we, we want to uh, hold something that maybe we see to be more precious to ourselves and we want to give leftovers back to God. And because of the identity in the difference of the value of the offerings that was given, Cain could not accept that now his own shortcomings have been highlighted. And rather than improve himself, rather than look within and figure out why did I give unto God less than what God had given unto me. Rather than correct himself, he chose to remove the comparison. And isn't that how we are many times in life? Rather than look within and try to figure out how do I undo what caused me to do that, I would rather discredit the person who set forth a better example. I would rather remove the better example rather than improve my own example. And so it tells us that, uh, first of all, we should recognize that we know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Uh, sometimes, and this may be one of those times, that a lot of emphasis is placed upon uh, hate. Uh, some, I would like to uh, share this uh, scenario uh, to kind of give an oversight. But if uh, we're in a classroom setting and we have one or two students out of the group and we may have 30 students in a class, but one or two may be a little disorderly. And because they are disorderly, they bring a certain behavior, they bring a certain uh, emphasis into the setting that distorts the purpose for which we were gathered or assembled together in a group. And because of this disorder, they receive certain attention. There's certain, uh, a certain distraction. And now it has to be entertained because it is affecting the order of why we were assembled. And so a lot of times disorder receives unwarranted attention above that which is orderly. And so uh, sometimes we give a lot of credence and recognition to hatred and the effects of hatred, which is duly required, but it sometimes overrides the attention that should be given to love and the benefits and the rewards of loving compared 
to the outcomes of hatred. And so when the scripture spoke of that uh, death and life, now we know that Cain was removed um, and sent off into a wilderness area. But uh, Cain did not immediately die. It was the same with Adam. When Adam disobeyed God, it was said that death was going to come upon Adam because of Adam's disobedience. But Adam lived. But the the outcome here is, is that was the living fruitful or was it damaging? And so when we think of the death, uh, it's not always speaking of a immediate physical departure. But many times it speaks of that although we are still a physical living being, but our practices, our mindset, our behavior, our conduct is on a path of destruction. And so those things are not lively things, but those things are deadly things. And for those that love, they should uh, receive and, and give honor and, and gratitude and appreciation that God has called us into that which is lively, productive, constructive, and beneficial to us rather than dwelling in a sea of death. Now it says in part two of our lesson, it says love is demonstrated. And it said this is how we know what love is. Christ laid down his life for us. And we are to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. And then it says one of these ways, because a lot of times when we present that connotation of sacrificing your life for the life of others, uh, that's somewhat of an ultimatum that all of us are not willing to respond yes to. Uh, maybe first, uh, maybe uh, close family members. Uh, we say, well, beyond a doubt, I would die for my spouse. I would die for my children. I would die for my parents. But sometimes that doesn't extend beyond the immediacy of our family. But then uh, scripture goes further and it tells us that if anyone has material possessions and they see their brother or sister in need, but they don't have any pity on them, then how can the love of God be in that person? So it's not always just speaking about uh, the sacrificial life of us as individuals dying for someone, but the sacrifice can be, are you willing to give when you see a need? Are you willing to sacrifice time? Are we willing to sacrifice capabilities? Are we willing to sacrifice something that maybe we hold dear to ourselves, which may just be lingering in our midst, not fully in use, but we have a certain affinity to it and we don't want to let it go. So it's saying, if you see your brother or your sister in need, will you sacrifice things you hold dear to yourself so that someone else may benefit from it? Those sacrifices are the things that we can do. And so uh, without the ultimatum of 
uh, the end of our physical being. And it says, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. Now, uh, we are approaching to the last part of our lesson, but I, I want to look at uh, some things pertaining to uh, the spirit that God uh, breathe upon us and because of this then we know that okay uh, there is a higher power working within me because it checks me it corrects me it lets me know no not you but me and so it tells us that uh, we should be able to distinguish between these two and what I would like to entertain is the uh, sixth chapter of Galatians uh, verses uh, 7 uh, through 10. And it reads, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. For if he sows to his flesh, of the flesh he will reap corruption. But if he sows to the Spirit, of the Spirit he will reap everlasting life. So let us in the process, along the journey, let us not grow weary while doing good for in due season we shall reap if we faint not or in some translations it said if we do not lose heart therefore as we have opportunity let us do good to all especially to those who are of the household of faith. So we make a distinction here between love and hatred, or spirit and the flesh. And so we recognize things that are done, and a lot of times we like to say, I'm a natural man. And uh, I have natural, uh, natural capabilities. I have natural uh, functions and purposes in my being. And uh, it is good to recognize uh, our natural selves. But God did not create us just in a natural form. Scripture says he breathed into us and man became a living soul. And so a part of us is natural. We see things in the natural with our natural eye, but also there is a spiritual presence within us. And if we listen and if we adhere to the Spirit of God ministering to us, then we will sow things of the Spirit which are everlasting. But if we close off our hearing, he that hath an ear, let him hear what thus the Lord is saying. If we close that vehicle off, then we sow unto our natural self, and that brings, a, brings about corruption. So, uh, I want us to uh, focus on to this, because as it said in the 10th verse, as often as we have opportunity, that we should do good to all, especially those who are of the household of faith. Now, the last part 
of our lesson says love produces confidence and it spells it out just as plain and as clear as possible it says to us this is how we know that we belong to the truth and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence it says because if our heart condemns us then we know that God is greater than our hearts God is greater than our emotional reactions and responses if we are troubled in our heart then we know that the spiritual conviction and compelment of God is greater than our emotional reactions and it says and he knows everything and for those of us that uh, need just a little inferences on uh, he knows everything uh, read Psalms in your leisure read Psalms 139 uh, referred to and starting off by saying search me Lord and it talks about how that God knows our inner being that God is the creator of ourselves that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and then to show also that God is merciful read also in your spare times Psalm number 103 to see how God doesn't even punish us to the extent that we ought to do, but that God is merciful and kind and loving to us. And so it tells us that, dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, that we have confidence before God because we know God didn't have to check us. So these are, it said in one of the outcomes of our lesson, uh, uh, the commandment of love, and it was the obedience and the expectation. But this is one of the expectations, the reward and benefit of being in harmony with God. Because it says that if he doesn't have to check us, if he doesn't compel our spirit uh, in our emotional setting, that then we have confidence before God because we know that God has not condemned us. Therefore, my behavior must be accepted unto God. My behavior is approved of by God. And because of this, one of our rewards is, is that we will receive anything that we ask of God. Now, don't include in the anything all of our wants. Because a lot of times our wants are not our needs. But God will provide for us all of our needs. Because we kept his commands and we do what pleases him. It says, this is his command to believe in the name of the Son, Christ, and to love one another as he commands. And then it closes by telling us, the one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit that he gave us. We certainly hope and pray that something was said to encourage us, to correct us, to rebuild us, and to make us stronger in this walk with Almighty God. And as always, it is our prayer that we would be hearers, not just hearers, but also doers of the word of God. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.